it's hard to travel. I'm, I'm definitely concerned. I'm going to be wearing a mask. I'll try to stay away from people. I highly recommend taking some zinc every day and vitamin C. They're saying that's like one of the most helpful things if you do catch it to like prevent mm. it from getting into your lungs. So okay, it's good to know. Might help, you know, vitamin C just boosts your immunity, make sure you're getting your sleep. Don't over burn that candle and yeah, yeah you should be good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, cool. So what's this all about? What's this interview? What do you want to do? Oh, well, I wrote out some questions, mostly about film. Of course, we have to start with where in the world did you go to school? What was your major and why did you pick film out of all careers? I went to college at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And then I went to get my master's at USC in Los Angeles. I'd always wanted to make movies since I was a kid and I was always into filming when I was younger and really obsessed with animation and drawing. I knew when I was extremely young that this is what I wanted to do, this was my dream. In junior high school, I would start collecting original animation art from Disney movies, and learning the specifics of how everything works, and corresponding with Disney artists, and filmmakers, and learning the world that I was gonna get into. By the time I graduated high school, like I knew it pretty well. So I went to college for film at UNC because it was a good school and I loved basketball and USC didn't offer me a big enough scholarship for undergrad, so I couldn't afford to go there. But then after I graduated, I decided to still go to SC. It's very cool that you knew in junior high, by the way, because a lot of people, I feel like, still don't know what they want to do. Did you have like a doubt in your mind that you wanted to be a producer or did some part of you want to be the animator? Yeah, I definitely wanted to be an animator when I was very young. There were animators who I idolized and whose work, like in particular, I, I admired and actually collected. I got a paper route when I was a kid so that I could save money to buy their art. So that was definitely a dream. And I tried to become a great artist, but I just didn't have the talent to hit that marker. At my very, very best, I was competent at drawing. There wasn't a career in that. So when I was a freshman in high school, I went to go visit one of my idols who was animating Lilo from Lilo and Stitch in Orlando at Disney World. And I showed him some of my art and he was like, you know, it's okay. He was very honest. And I came home from that trip and decided the other thing that I was really interested in was producing. There were these like Disney behind the scenes videos in the 90s where they would always talk about the making of the films. And the producer was a guy named Don Hahn. He's sort of the surrogate Walt Disney. He would take you through the project, tell you all about it. He would be the one who represents the project to the public and asked like, what does a producer do? And he responded, it felt like it was more my skill set, being able to manage things and creatively give feedback, make something out of nothing. That was more what I was good at. I would be out hustling at night, selling glow sticks, games. I would sell costume jewelry. And it's like whatever you could for a buck, just trying to be street smart about it. That just felt very natural to me. So producing is, is more in my blood than sitting at a desk for eight hours a day drawing. I couldn't do that. I like how you said producing is making something out of nothing. Yeah, that's what a good producer has to do. I try to will things into existence. Every day you're just getting phone calls about why things can't get made or why things are being stopped or some obstacle. It's never a positive phone call. Like, congratulations, something's going right. Nobody ever wants to come to the producer and be like, hey, you're doing a great job. Boy, people want to complain or, you know, you kind of just have to be proactive and be ready for whatever strange issue will come up because that's sort of the job all day strange issues will come up i've had movies fall apart for reasons that were so out of my control that you know you go okay the producer's job he or she has one job is to get the thing made mm -hmm. universe is trying to stop that from happening it seems like there's so many issues that you run into that could stop you it's good to focus on just getting it made i have so many questions including what you have learned the most like you mentioned, things have gone wrong. Did that gear you up where you feel more confident in the future? What are some of those lessons you could share with newer filmmakers? It's a good question. Just having been sort of through the ringer a few times, you get rid of your amateur rattle. You start to understand that there are so many things outside of your control and for you to take all of that emotional stress upon yourself doesn't help because nothing you can do about it. Focus on what you can control, spend time thinking about that and also acknowledge most projects don't get made. Something that I did wrong three times in a row, which I'll never do again, is I focused for a couple of years on one project alone. And I was like, I'm gonna will this into existence. 
Yeah. Because animated movies take so long and take such energy. I'm like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna force this to get made. The three times they fell apart for reasons that I didn't foresee. They were valid, viable projects with real filmmakers. From now on, sort of my prerogative is to throw as much spaghetti against the wall and see which sticks. Because as a producer, you know, if I'm not engaged, if I'm not an employee of a studio, you know, I work for myself. Yeah. Make sure that somehow you're making something. An actor, you go to multiple auditions hoping that you get one of them. It's kind of a game of numbers at that point. It definitely hurts when you put your heart and soul into like connecting with the character, memorizing the lines, building the whole story in your head and you go out there and you want it so bad. And like you said, under circumstances that you cannot control saying, you know, the part was already going to be given to someone else. So they needed someone of a certain ethnic background or they needed someone with a different social media influence or with connections that you don't have. Something you cannot control. What were the reasons that one particular film ended? One ended because the financiers couldn't find distribution. One ended because the director, I sort of realized a couple of years in that like they weren't really serious about this and they sort of used this as an opportunity to sort of feel important. And another one fell apart because the two executive producers, their past caught up to them. Hmm. What do you mean by their past caught up to them? One of them's in jail, the other one will never work again. Oh dear. Okay. That certainly... <laughs> You can check that off. <laughs> yeah. For the directors, how do you go about ensuring you hire someone that's there for the right reasons and shares the passion for the film? It's tough. In feature animation, there are only so many proven filmmakers. It's sort of more in line with the old Hollywood system where a lot of these filmmakers are employees of studios rather than independent filmmakers who go from, from studio to studio, like in live action, making different films. The dream is to find a younger filmmaker who isn't under lock and key yet by a studio and enable them to make a great first film. Mm. Sometimes that works out, sometimes it doesn't. Directors, unfortunately, in animation are replaced quite often. It's a difficult process. As much about storytelling, it is about being able to manage a crew of people over the course of years. A live action director is on set for a couple of months and they're shooting exactly what they, more or less what they plan to do. But in an animated movie, you could continue working on this film for years and years and years with no end, with a whole crew just sort of sitting there. It's terrifying if not everyone has a harmonizing vibe. Do you yeah. other folks participate in multiple projects at once or would that just be the producer? Just the producer. On an animated movie, you know, it's a full-time job for everyone involved. If you're a producer with multiple projects, either way, you need to hire an associate producer to run the day-to-day -day of the animated movie. Somebody who, you know, is a, is a trusted lieutenant who can act as the surrogate. But luckily, there are a lot of great people in those roles. Those folks come up through the ranks and work their way up and they have far more production experience. Maybe the producer does. Are they one of the producers or do they enjoy that exact role? Yeah, I mean, a lot of them, you know, that's the associate producer works their way up to producer. Like that's one way to become a producer, working your way up from production assistant to associate producer to producer. I didn't do that. There are a few different ways you can become a producer. That wasn't the path that I felt like I was best suited for. Mm -hmm. I'm not so good, for lack of a better term, a cog in a machine for long periods of time. It doesn't utilize my skill set. My skill set is my ability to create something out of nothing and to go hustle and you know, make relationships and put things together and, yeah. and like an obsessiveness that it doesn't stop. Whereas being like a production coordinator or production supervisor in a specific department, it takes a lot of focus on one specific thing as it relates to the rest of the film. It's just not something that I'm particularly fond of. Do you feel as though you have a go-to associate producer now for your next film? Yeah, there's some really great associate producers and there's some great like production managers who are ready to move up to associate producer. You know, once you're ready to make a film, you start to look at who's available. You know, it's a very long commitment. The people that are good are always working. Whereas in action there are more great line producers 
and they're constantly moving from show to show because you know, they can do two, maybe three movies a year. Mm-hmm. Or as a, an animation, you're on one movie for four years potentially. Is there work in television animation for you? Yeah, I'm actually going to take out my first TV animation pitch and it's something like really proud of. I'm getting more interested in it and what you're able to do in TV animation. And I think the fact that TV animation moves so much faster than feature, that excites me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what happens with this pitch. It'll probably happen in the next couple of weeks. We'll take it to the studios and see who bites. I'm just thinking about how long Simpsons has been around and like South Park and a lot of those shows, they're kind of timeless now and you just keep writing characters in or like keep current situations and topics going and it seems really fun. I don't know if you're allowed to share anything about your pitch or the idea without kind of telling too much but is there like a little you can share about it? Yeah like what excites me the most about it is the creator. He's a young Nigerian American artist. He was a designer on a big Netflix DreamWorks show. The creator of that show introduced us and he, he said, this guy's a genius, basically. Like, his stuff is groundbreaking. And, and when I met with him and saw his stuff, I agreed with him. It was something I'd never seen before. And it was very personal what he wanted to do, but also sort of universal because it was about the human experience. And it's hilarious. So I put him with two other writers because he's not a writer. And the three of them, just like sitting in the Zoom meetings with them as they craft the Bible for the project, has been some of the most fun I've ever had. One of the writers is very experienced in feature films, and the other has like this super unique life experience, and he's really talented as a performer and a writer. And then the creator himself has his own unique experience. And when the three of them get together, some alchemy happens. And then I get to just sort of help guide and, you know, sort of stay out of it mostly because it's their story now, but it's fun to help shepherd it and make sure that it gets to see the light of day. I have a really good vibe about that. You always want to work with people that inspire you and you feel like are special and like these little hidden gems. You just feel so grateful to work with them and to have met them. Like you said, foster their creative journey. So he found you and pitched this idea, or you somehow came about him? The creator of this other big show, I asked him sort of like, who are the young filmmakers who I might be able to help push up? He was like, you should meet this artist. And when I did, he mentioned that he had this project, this idea. I thought it it sounded very personal. It sounded really cool. He pitched it as, what if the Rugrats were Ratchet? The ghetto? Is that what that is? Yeah, they're not as like clean cut. They're doing their thing on the streets. Nothing bad. It's a different lifestyle, different world. Where would it take place? A city that's created specifically for the show. It's like a Springfield, but it's, you know, it's a modern day gentrifying American city. That makes sense. All the issues that ensue from that. Very interesting. I feel like you could kind of build a platform actually from that to influence some social norms or social change and speak about some topics that are pretty heavy. Yeah, I think if there's a positive experience, it'll leave positive light. It'll show things from a unique perspective. There's a few things that I'm working on that I think will have a positive impact while also be really entertaining. And that makes me happy. It is the only reason I got into the film industry. I love that so much. A big question people ask me all the time, on credits, they see so many different producer lines, whether it's line producer or executive producer, producer this, producer that. This is mostly friends not in the industry. What's the best way you can describe all the different credits for producers and how yours is very different from a lot of the others? Sure. There are various types of producers and there are types of producers that actually work on the projects uh, on a day-to-day basis. There are some that mostly deal with the rights issues and you can become a producer one of many different ways. There's producers who just bring money to the table who are wealthy and finance the film or they're able to find money and bring it to the film. There are producers like line producers or associate producers who handle the day-to-day production management of the, the project. There are creative producers who partner with the director and spend their days with that person, making sure the project moves smoothly on a macro level and interacting with the studio and the financiers on their end. It depends. In live action, in in feature films, the producer, capital P producer, is sort of the boss on the film. So they either put the movie together themselves and are overseeing it, or they were brought on 
by the studio to produce it. Whereas in TV, the executive producer is the boss. They're the showrunner potentially, or the creator. There are a number of executive producers generally on these shows. There isn't like a specific definition. You can get an executive producer credit from different areas. If you're the author of the book that they're basing the project off of, you're an executive producer. If you're partnered with one of the people that they wanted to join the project because that person is important enough to help sell the project, you can get an executive producer credit. And then in TV, there's also producer credits for writers, producer, supervising producer, co-producer to work your way up through the ranks. There really isn't a definite way to describe it because film and TV are so different. And then animation itself is different. In animation, the line producer is called the associate producer. In live action, the associate producer can be somebody who was someone's assistant who's getting their first credit just because they were helping out. It's confusing for anybody who looks at those credits. Like I can look at those credits and go, I'm not exactly sure what that person did. I know it takes a village to make a film. It's definitely true when you look at those credits. There's old time credits. My dad's obsessed with black and white films. How they have the credits in the beginning are really cute. They're like first appearance and then at the end there's just like a couple of roles. It's interesting how much the industry has changed since then and with technology, just everything. Yeah. The next question, another beginner filmmaker question. We're just going to like keep it super simple. How in the world do you get a film made? I don't know. <laughs> I think first off is, you know, if you, if you try to make a film that's low budget and you can go raise money independently and you go, go off and just make your movie, you don't need permission from anybody except the people who are paying for it. Um, that's the easiest way. Whether or not that film will turn out well, or whether it'll have a, a, an audience, or whether a distribution company will pick it up, you know, these are things that you can't determine at that stage. Generally, the toughest part of making a movie for an independent filmmaker is financing. If you actually have money, you can then go to agents and make meaningful offers to actors, and they might come aboard, and you're off and running. The difficult things besides financing are finding creative talent behind the camera. You know, writers and directors who are worth their weight in gold are rare. So if you're a young filmmaker and you're just starting out, you kind of got to create something within your means that you can handle. You know, don't go out and try to make Avatar your first time out. But there's a million different ways to make a movie. You know, it really comes down to where do you get the money? And do you have a script that's worth getting made? Mm-hmm. If you're a producer, your job is to find property, find a script, find a book, find some type of intellectual property that you respond to creatively, and then find a writer and director who you feel will best represent that project and go find the money. It's interesting because you see these like one person shows like Phoebe, she's created such a name for herself. And then there's people that tackle these really ridiculous complicated projects but i think you're right keeping it simple if you're a first time filmmaker is is probably a good idea so the pandemic is real how do you think that will influence the film industry and what is to come next i know we're still kind of not even getting real new films coming out in theaters people aren't going to movie theaters right now at all i'm very excited for wonder woman to come out a lot of things are going straight to the platforms online whether it's netflix or amazon prime or hbo which is like a whole nother thing i wish it was just all in one streaming platform how do you foresee the future of either television or film as an actor i know that I'm only getting commercial auditions right now. I haven't gotten any film auditions, but maybe one. And that one had a to be determined filming date. So it seems like no one really is filming on set right now for film or TV shows. So it's a big question. So there's there's two prongs to it. One is the production end and one's the distribution exhibition, uh, ex- exhibition end. Uh, production, you know, especially for independent films, um, they rely on production insurance, which means that the the bond company, which promises essentially that the film will be delivered for the financiers, um, they're not gonna bond a movie that doesn't have production insurance. So what happens if your lead actor gets sick uh, from COVID 
and then you're shut down for a while and you have a crew sitting there do you have to pay them do you like there are there are just a lot of things or practical elements that come up i mean mm -hmm. batman was just shut down because batman himself got COVID. uh robert pattinson the actor got COVID. Yeah. so like wow. You know, until there's a vaccine, this is all going to be very messy. Production is difficult, although they're, they're doing it. I mean, you have to find places where there aren't that many cases of COVID and sort of create like a, a bubble if you can. Um, you know, larger budget projects obviously can do that with a lot greater ease than smaller projects. Uh, though sm very small projects, they can just have a tiny crew and then really cordon off specific areas and really play it correctly. But I know of a lot of projects that are not really following the rules because a lot of people, you know, the the assistance that was given to to Americans in particular by the government uh, has ended, the financial assistance, and people don't have any money. So they have to go make something. They have to go make commercials and, you know, and risk COVID. Yeah. So that's the production end of it. But once there's a vaccine, things will start to, you know, move back to it's normal, but then, you know, some people won't take the vaccine and then you have to be more careful even still. So I think the next couple of years will be interesting uh, in terms of production. In terms of distribution and exhibition, you know, we're going through a major shift and the industry will look completely different in a year than it does today. Um, you know, agencies, I think their, their roles and projects will shift. Um, there's been a, you know, a mass layoff, uh, uh, the mass layoffs already from from these agencies. Um, I think there won't be as much a demand from audiences for theatrical films. I think there there are a lot of screens in America that will either get shut down or theaters will get bought by by distributors um, or tech companies like Amazon or Disney, and they'll sort of create these sort of unique movie going experiences like imagine your amc your local regal is purchased by disney like what does that look like is there's a disney store there's a or, or it's amazon and they have you know they're renting out their theaters they're picking which films to to show it's not going to be like it has been in recent memory um there's also something called the paramount decree which was just overturned which uh, in the 50s was created because there was a monopoly, essentially a, a vertical integration uh, issue with movie producers, production companies also distributing their own films, which broke some pretty pretty major uh, antitrust laws. Mm -hmm. But now that's been returned. So you know there's going to be some more interesting things that come out of that uh, in the next couple of years. Um, you know. There's now this sort of window between theatrical release and digital release is shrinking and shifting and, and, you know, people, I think companies will start to decide, well, should we just send that directly to our streamer as part of the monthly package price? Should we do this project at a premium price part of the streamer or should we send that directly to theaters? Um, because at some at some financial point, it might not be worth sending your movie, which you initially had always planned to distribute theatrically, sending it to the theaters. The print and advertising for these films are enormous. Um, and if it's a smaller budget film with a smaller audience, it might not be worth sending to theaters. So, you know, the there's there's definitely going to be a collapse of the number of films, I think, that will be released theatrically on a wide scale. There might be films released on smaller scales, uh, fewer theaters, um, targeted at specific areas. Um, so just in a, in a big picture view, it's, the pandemic is accelerating what was already happening. Yeah. Uh, movie going was, was sort of becoming, you know, people, people used to go to the movies constantly. They don't as much now. There's a lot of competition for their time. So the pandemic really just sort of accelerated a lot of this, these changes. That's really interesting. And I did hear that things were changing, or at least it felt like things were changing for a while, especially with digital content. I know a lot of people have been pushing for films just advertised on social media and getting different influencers to post and, and different things. So I know I'm sure they're saving a lot of money doing it that way, unless they're paying them a ridiculous amount of money. I don't know. 
but wow, that was some really good, insightful thoughts for what's to come. I always thought it would be cool that they like rent out theaters for way more than just movies anyways, whether it was like NFL games or, you know, like say you couldn't go to a concert in Colorado, why not just put it on a screen and have a bunch of people come. There's so much more you can do with, with having like a really cool theater like that. I don't know if I'd want to go into a theater right now, but yep. I'm sure when it does feel a little safer, you could do a lot of really cool things. To your point, I mean, theaters are mostly empty and they have been, the theater is usually only packed like Friday night, Saturday night. There's a lot of empty seats. You go to movies, on Tuesday afternoon and you're like the only person there. You can rent out those screens for esports. People will show up for that. For you want to talk about games, concerts, there's other opportunities. I think more people might show up to these theaters for these specific purposes. There's so much you can do. I even thought of a room dedicated to working out together. Like instead of doing at home stuff by yourself, you could go take a class with people, have like yoga mats set out, dim the theater lights and have like a giant yoga class projected there's so many possibilities yeah we'll see what ends up happening kind of crazy for some people that aren't natural networkers how did you go about building a team to make one of your projects i think you have to sort of know who these people are and understand a little bit of the industry and most of this information is public you can just read variety.com or deadline.com and sort of understand who the players are how things get made on a, on a studio scale or a larger independence scale, if it's just you and your buddies, you know, you just go make some. But it's hard to find your way in. It's hard to figure out how to get these people to pay attention to you. But if you know your stuff, if you genuinely can hold a conversation and prove that you're somebody they should be working with, people are receptive. People can tell. People can tell that you've put in the work. Yeah. You're, you're, you're doing it. Even if you don't have giant credits to your name. People start... You know, everyone has to start somewhere. So you can either sort of get a job at one of these existing companies and work your way up there, get a job through production and like work your way up as a PA and sort of learn the ropes that way. You can uh, make something small on your own that gets notice and work your way up that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about finding the right people and the right project. That's really it. It's the relationships and the projects. I think it's very, like you said, to reach out and know your worth and hope that they see that. But also, I know you mentioned the really good ones are always busy and working. How do you end up working with someone that probably is taking a shot on you, but is always full to capacity on jobs that are established? I know a lot of people who like start as a production assistant, which is a relatively easy job to get, relatively. It's still, you know, there's still a lot of people vying for it, but it's not like, you know, directing a movie. Um, and who befriend people, you know, you just be on the set and you're like, you kind of show that you're smart and, you know, you can sort of say, hey, to a director or something, you know, like, hey, can I be your assistant for your next movie? Um, and you get, and then you get to sort of work your way up and partner with that director. You know, that's how a lot of directors find their, and producers find their sort of, their people um and then once that director hits it big and they need someone to run their day-to-day -day, you're there so a lot of it's right place right time unless you're a, an insane genius uh, and you you know you'll find a way no matter what but a lot of people who are just sort of as talented as the people who failed they succeed like it's it's Sometimes you get in the right place, right time. Things just happen. But putting yourself in that place is step one. But I still think that, you know, it takes a lot of courage and bravery to put yourself out there and speak to someone on like, being on a set is so nerve wracking. You're like, you want to be seen, but don't want to bother people. And time is so important of the essence. And that is so cool. I think you're incredibly inspiring. I'm very excited to see what happens with this animated project that you're working on now. and to see anything you make next. Thank you, you're very inspiring too. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I guess I can end it with asking a question about a humbling experience that you might have 
um, run into over your course of being in the film industry? If there's anything that you would consider a humbling experience? Yeah, every day I get something. The job is kind of getting punched in the face all day, deciding if you're going to get back up again. I'm trying to do this music video for a giant group that's animated that would be pretty groundbreaking. And it's a music video. It's not it's not a $10 million movie. It's not a $100 million movie. It's just a video. I just want to, to finish it. I just want to see it get done. It just keeps finding ways to die. And then it just keeps finding ways to come back. So like there was a financing opportunity that finally came through because it was a pretty expensive music video. And then I'm like, oh, our director can't direct it because he works for a company that's a rival of the company that would pay for it. Oh, all right. So then I got to find out another solution. Then the lawsuit between the record label and the lawyers and the band. And you're like, oh, well now it's dead again. And you're like, you are humbled all day. And if you can persevere, cool. But if you take it personally, like I, I take a lot of things personally and I get very offended personally and I'm very sensitive, even though I don't necessarily show it. But like, I have to sit down and kind of just close my eyes sometimes and go like, it's okay. Like, don't be driven into the ground by this. Things will go. I don't know. You're going to get humbled all the time. And I could list 30 examples if you needed. What inspires you to keep going? What's your greatest core flame that gets you going every morning to do what you do? I think everybody has to just have this sort of core set of values that drives them. The amount that you care about that has to outweigh everything else. Mm -hmm. I care more about creating something that will make people happy, that will bring some joy, that will sort of pay forward what, what my idols paid forward to me and my generation and, and our generation. That to me sort of outweighs all of the crap. You know, there's a saying like, focus on the donut, not the whole. Like the donut is making something. The whole is like everything else. Most of your life in this industry is spent dealing with all the other crap, you know, egos or financing or, you know, just circumstances. But if you can kind of deal with all that stuff, then you actually get to deal with the donut, just thing that you're making. And that's what matters. A lot of people don't have the personality to withstand it. And there are plenty of times where I think I don't have the personality to withstand it because it's not great. It's hard. Like sometimes you're like, it shouldn't be this hard, but for some reason it just is. You deal with it or you don't. You leave. Well, you are awesome. I know being a Scorpio, you have the perseverance for the job. <laughs> Literally a phoenix is the Scorpio. I'm excited to see what you make next. It has been delightful having you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Craig. My pleasure. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.